Well, good morning. Good morning. Come on in. Find a seat. It's glad to see you here today. Thank you for uh, joining again together as we assemble to uh, exalt Christ and encourage one another in our walk with him. If you are here visiting with us today, we are thrilled to have you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we'd love to get a record of your visit and also let you know a little bit more about the church. And uh, so if you scan this QR code, a couple of things. Uh, one, you, uh, if you can fill out that form, uh, we'll send you a coupon for a free cup of coffee at Crazy Love Coffee House here in Roswell. And uh, also as you do that, you'll be able to learn some more uh, things about our church, and uh, we are glad to have you here today. So, members, be on the lookout for uh, new faces. Make sure you introduce yourself and uh, get to know some of these uh, folks that are visiting with us today. Um, a reminder for all of our members that tonight is our quarterly members meeting, so our church partnership meeting beginning at 5 o'clock, and uh, several important things that we're going to be discussing. Uh, we're going to be highlighting uh, several of the new members that have joined over the last number of months, uh, discussing about some of the needs and um, opportunities within the church family for ministry and care. Uh, we'll be discussing some of the uh, recent uh, things with our building program and the remodel, and then also uh, it's our uh, approving the budget for this upcoming year. So a lot of things that are going to be going on in that meeting tonight. And so I want to encourage all of members to make sure that you are uh, there for that. If you're not a member, you're welcome to come and sit in and just kind of peek in the back door and see how we operate as a church. And then afterwards, we're going to have our church cookout, and uh, that'll be uh, around 6.30, uh, but we'll go out onto the slab and enjoy a cookout there, so uh, look forward to uh, a time of fellowship for that uh, this evening. Those of you that are interested in, in serving in the children's ministry or the youth ministries, uh, we will have a special training time uh, as we kick off the fall, and that'll be on August 11th at 6 o'clock. Dinner will be provided, and so dinner will be a part of all of that as we kind of fellowship together, get to know one another, and reconnect again after the summer. Uh, but then uh, the children's workers and the youth sponsors will divide up, and there'll be specific training time for that. So if you're interested in being involved in children's ministry, or youth ministry, you can uh, contact uh, Pastor Mark for the children's ministry, Pastor Josh for the teens, and uh, we'd love to see more of our folks getting involved in, in uh, discipling the next generation in that way. And then uh, coming up in just a few weeks, August 27th, 28th, and 29th is our Missions Emphasis Weekend. Uh, this is going to be a, a great time as a lot of our team from Southeast Asia is going to be here together. And uh, we'll he hear an update of what God's doing in getting more individuals and families over there. And uh, just celebrate what God is doing uh, through our church and see some of the opportunities that we have uh, to continue the advance of the gospel around the world. And uh, so I hope that you will make your plans to be a part of that. It'll be a Friday evening, a Saturday morning, and then a Sunday morning. We'll have that special focus and that emphasis on um, our, uh, our global evangelism. All right. Um, at this point, I want to uh, have Mark come, and we have uh, some updates uh, regarding the uh, building initiative. And um, he's got some information for us. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I wanted to give you a brief update on our fundraising project for the building initiative that's going on here around the church. And I'll just say at the beginning, this isn't going to be a, a full-blown update for you. It's going to be kind of a little bit of a teaser for you to come back tonight uh, in the partnership meeting to kind of get the full story. But I just want to say as we talk about the fundraising project and the building project, I just want to say thank you to all of those who have responded already to the fundraising and I'd like to this morning just kind of share an initial response with you all of how that is going. When we introduced the building initiative, uh, we mentioned that the funds needed to complete the project would be between three and four uh, million dollars. And um, as of today, uh, there is $625,000 pledged over the course of two years. So $625,000 pledged over the course of two years. And of that $625,000, we've already received $255,000 already in, in the bank. So we wanna say thank you to that. Of the giving units that uh, give regularly in our church, we're seeing a participation rate of 47%. Those are people who have let us know their intentions to give or who have already given. 
So this is a, a good start to that initial push for funding this project. And I want to say, again, we are so thankful for those who have given towards it. And as we continue to press onward to completing the project, um, we would love to hear from more of you about how you might plan to participate in the giving uh, towards this project. And of course, if you have any questions to what we're doing or why we're doing, we would love to answer your questions and take those and make sure that you've got all of your questions answered. And personally, I love seeing all of the improvements that we have so far. I mean, we're just in a, we're just in like really the pre-renovation phase. We haven't really even begun to start the major heavy lifting of the project, but there is a lot to celebrate that we have already gotten done in this pre-renovation phase. We've got a nice, freshly updated exterior. We've got new gutters. We've got a nice looking steeple. In fact, I have been up there on the lift to inspect it myself. It looks just as beautiful up close as it does far away. Um, We've got brand new windows that let in a lot of natural light, but they're also sealed properly so they keep the moisture out and they reduce our energy consumption. We've got beautiful new entryway doors that let in tons of light, but they also have security features that are, have been improved so that we can lock and unlock the church at a press of a button or a pr- button on an app. Tim, you may not know this, but Tim has a beautiful new office and work area right here in this corner. We've moved everything that he's done over there, and now he's got this efficient workspace to get his work done quickly and efficiently. And then you know what? We've got brand new, gorgeous bathrooms, and they're open today. Praise the Lord. All God's people said amen, all right? And they're not totally finished yet, but I'm telling you guys, they are very, very beautiful. It's kind of weird to be excited about bathrooms, but boy howdy, I am, okay? And uh, you should go check them out and see the work that has been done You know, I've been leading tours every chance I get when they're not in use, of course. I bring people down there and I show them just what we, the improvements that we have done around the building. And so when I look at what we've done, I'm thankful. I'm so grateful for what we've done. But there's more to be done, right? We've got a, we've got a children's wing that is in desperate need of attention This room, even right here, needs a lot of TLC. There's more to be done. So when I look into the future, I'm hopeful because I know that these changes are going to really help us improve how we do ministry here so that we can focus on people and not the problems of the building. So I just want to encourage you, if you've not yet participated in this project or not let let us know what your plans are and how you might give. We'd love to hear from you and we'd love for everybody to come back tonight because there's so much more to say and more will be given about the building project and how we are going to finance it. So come back tonight for the partnership meeting and uh, we'll learn more about our plans for the future. At this time we'd like to uh, turn our attention to the reason why we have gathered here today And we have gathered here to celebrate God's amazing grace. There is something about God's grace that is so humbling and yet so wonderful. It's humbling to know that we need grace because we are a people who often don't want it. We're people who are proud. We don't like to get help. We don't like to admit that we have a need. But God, in his grace reveals to us our need. He shows us just how broken and helpless and hopeless we are. But he doesn't just leave us there, does he? Oh no, he comes in with salvation. He comes in with a message of forgiveness and grace. And through his son, Jesus Christ, he takes our lives and he totally transforms them. And he puts us He makes us not just his friends, he makes us his family. And we're put into his family as adopted children, 
and God just lavishes his grace on us. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. It's not a little bit of grace. He doesn't give it to us begrudgingly. Oh, God pours out his grace, and it's more grace than you and I could ever take. It is a grace that is greater than all of our sin. And so we're going to be celebrating that this morning. And I would just like to kind of pray to prepare our hearts for what we're going to sing about, what we're going to say and pray, and what will be preached. Would you pray with me? Lord, we're so thankful that your grace has reached down to save us. Lord, we thank you that you looked upon us and had mercy and pity, even though we had rebelled against you and we thought life would be better without you. And Lord, even though we have sinned, Lord, thank you that your mercy and grace was lavished upon us. You gave us the greatest gift you could ever give. You gave us your son. And thank you for the redemption that is in his, through his blood. Thank you that we can stand before you completely forgiven, completely saved. Lord, all of our lives from beginning to end is a product of your grace. You gave us life in our mother's womb. You knew all the days that were appointed for us. Lord, you have walked with us through every moment and for the believers here this morning, you have done your work of transforming grace in our lives. You have changed us and saved us and added us to your family. And Lord, we thank you for grace that also leads us safely home. And Lord, as we think of Chris and his passing, Lord, we thank you that grace led him home. Thank you that he stands before you righteous. Chains are gone. He's been set free. And Lord, we thank you for that. We pray for your sustaining grace for the family at this time. Lord, help us as we sing. Help us as we read your scripture and hear your word preached. Oh Lord, mold our hearts. Move us to greater love and passion for you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. Let's all stand together. And we're going to begin singing this morning of God's amazing grace that has transformed our lives.
set us on the rock, which is Christ. Let's sing together, the Lord is my salvation. God redeeming us by his grace is to do really one thing. It's to draw our attention back to him as a good and gracious God. In Ephesians 1, he does all these things for us to the praise of his glorious grace. Let's sing together, praise God from whom all blessings flow. God from whom all blessings flow, praise Him all creatures here below, praise Him above ye heavenly hosts, praise Father, Son, and Holy
Our scripture reading this morning is going to be from the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, it says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger, and clamor, and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. We're going to continue this morning on our, kind of the theme of forgiveness. But as we pray this morning, I want to Especially remember the Jernigan family. As uh, most of you are aware, Dr. Chris Jernigan passed away last, uh, yesterday. And uh, so please be in prayer for uh, the family as they grieve. And there may be some of you here who you're visiting with us this morning and you don't know who uh, this person is. Or maybe you've just always sat on this side of the room and you've never been accosted by Chris in one of his spontaneous prayer sessions. Uh, but I know he was such an encourager. And uh, he would affirm any good he saw in you, and he'd tell you it. And I know that will be deeply missed. He'll be deeply missed as a person. And it's actually the the very things in which he reflected Jesus most are the things that we're going to miss the most. But that's the amazing truth is that he now gets to be with Jesus. He wrote on a a whiteboard uh, with he had these masks on, he wrote in big letters, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And so he is experiencing now the very thing that he so passionately lived for. So as we pray this morning, let's just remember together, let's remember the Jernigan family, and we'll pray for them, as well as even our church body as we mourn our loss. Father, we do want to praise you in your holy name. Because you are good all the time. Lord, we as a body came together last week and prayed earnestly that you might heal Dr. Jernigan. There were many, many sessions of prayer, hours of prayer. And Lord, you, you have answered And so, Lord, I pray you'd give grace to receive your answer. Not just to our church body, but, Lord, specifically to the family. I pray you'd give freedom to Julie, Chris, to the family as they mourn and as they grieve, that they'd have the freedom to fully grieve. To both celebrate Dr. Jernigan, in your presence, but then also to mourn the loss here. Lord, would you comfort them now? Would you assure the family of your presence in a special way? I pray that our body, our church body, would rally around and support. We comfort And Lord, that they might know the love of Jesus because of the love of the body that they experience. 
we again praise you for who you are and what you do. I pray you continue to comfort. Lord, help us as we dive into your word this morning. As we look again at this most wonderful truth, the truth of your forgiveness. Lord, and how you view us, how you look at us, what you've done with our sin, that you would encourage our hearts, that you'd strengthen us, that you would increase our devotion and our love for you as we seek to live for you day by day. Lord, we ask for your continued grace as we continue to sing, as we continue to lift up our hearts in worship. Lord, help us in our weaknesses. Strengthen us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ours is a God who is gracious and kind. He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. But it doesn't mean that God has just brushed aside his justice and his holiness. No, God has actually dealt with our sins in a proper way. He took all of the wrath that we deserved and he put it on his son so that he could look at us and receive us as his children. Let's all stand together and sing The Power of the Cross. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day Christ on the road to Calvary Tried by sinful men Torn and beaten then Nailed to a cross of wood Oh, to see the pain
At this time, we would like to dismiss our kids out the back door, K-4 through the second grade. Parents, if you're new to our gathering, a teacher will meet you out in the hallway. Then you can pick up your children at the conclusion of our gathering down this hallway. Final hymn together is God's grace greater than all of our sin. Let's sing together. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds Well, if you would, again, you can open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, we are going to just continue along the theme of last week. If you remember, last week we dealt with the a parable of the two debtors, and in particular, of how Jesus offers forgiveness to Pharisees, and he offers forgiveness, forgiveness to great sinners as well. And so I, I do want to just say, you know, because we're going to continue along the theme of forgiveness, that Mark, I do forgive you for the mermaid tale and things of that sort. I don't know if, if, you, if you don't know what I'm talking about. I laid down here on the stage last week. And um, very quickly after that, I saw on social media a picture of me laying on the stage with a mermaid tail and a trident in my hand. <laughs> I know it was Amanda's idea. <clears throat> but... We are going to continue along those lines, the lines of forgiveness and understanding God's forgiveness of us. This is going to be a little bit different today. Um, we're used to coming to a particular passage and parking in that passage and diving into that passage and just asking all sorts of questions about a passage so that we fully understand the meaning of that particular text and then we apply it to our life. We are going to instead be dealing more with the topic today. Of forgiveness, And so we are going to fly around to a lot of different passages. You may get some paper cuts on your fingers as you turn from passage to passage in your Bible, or maybe your thumbs might get sore if you're using your phone or your tablet. But we will be uh, dashing around to different verses this morning to look a little bit deeper at the topic of forgiveness. 
And I really want to set up this week and next week. And so I want to do that by looking again real quickly at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Then after discussing this week and next week, we'll pray and we'll begin our message today. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, it says this, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So what we're going to do, if we want to obey this verse, then we need to be forgiving each other as God in Christ forgave us. And so what we're going to do this week is we're going to look at how God in Christ forgave us. Okay? We're going to look at the, you might say we're going to take a dive, deep dive into forgiveness. And in particular, what did God do with our sin? How did he forgive us? Then next week, we'll take that same concept and we'll say, okay, so now what are the implications of this then for me to forgive other people? And what does the Bible teach about me forgiving others as God has forgiven me? So today we're going to be looking at three things. One, what is forgiveness? Two, what are the pre-requirements for forgiveness? Are there any? Okay. And then three, we will begin looking at some of the implications of God's forgiveness to us. So what is forgiveness? What are the pre-requirements for forgiveness? And then what are some implications of forgiveness? That will be the three things that we dive in today. I know we won't finish, which is why we have next week as well. Okay? Let's pray together. Father, you know how desperately I need you this morning to present accurately and passionately such a beautiful truth, a life-giving, destiny-altering truth of your merciful and your gracious forgiveness of our sin. Lord, there may be some here this morning who they've never received your forgiveness I pray, Lord, that you would give them the humility, the self-awareness, the conviction that's needed so that they might seek forgiveness. But Lord, there are many of us in this room who approach forgiveness possibly incorrectly. We either presume upon it, or we may actually seek to pay for it. Lord, I pray you'd use this morning to encourage our hearts, to build us up, to strengthen us, that we might see the meaning of and the depths of your forgiveness. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, We're going to deal with those three things. What is forgiveness? What are the pre-requirements for forgiveness? And then what are the implications of forgiveness? Let's talk about this first one. What is forgiveness? Um, If you Google what is forgiveness, aside from the Merriam-Webster cheesy definition, which says something about, you know, the the act of being forgiven. (laughs) Oh, thank you. Thank you, Merriam-Webster. That was so helpful. Um, You're going to find right underneath that a psychologist's definition of forgiveness, which says this. It's a conscious, deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment or vengeance towards a person or group who has harmed you. I think it's, I like, I like a lot of that definition. But that, once again, is focusing on a person's forgiveness of another person. And there's some depth and understanding that is missing from that definition that actually enables us to do that. And so I began to look through Scripture and try to find a definition for forgiveness. You know, it's, it, forgiveness is kind of hard to define. It's one of those words that you, you think you know what it means until you really try to describe it and you try to state it. And then you're kind of like, you, you keep giving all of these like conditions. And well, I guess it's not really this and it's not really that and it is this and it is that. So we're going to kind of do some of that today. But I want to give you my conclusion. Okay. Here we go. 
Forgiveness, the definition that I've written down here, is the gracious and merciful work of God in separating our sins from us and removing the just judgment we deserve. Okay? The gracious and merciful work of God in separating our sins from us and removing the just judgment we deserve. Now, I think that forgiveness is such an important topic. Okay? I think sin and its consequences are all over this room. Okay? All of us in here are wrestling to one degree or another with the consequences and the results of sin. The sin in our own hearts as well as the sin from other people. And so you today might be really, really down, struggling with shame, with guilt, with fear, with insecurities because of your sin. Maybe even because of the complications of other people's sin. And I think God so wants us to meditate on and to think on what forgiveness is that in the Bible, he gives us lots of pictures. Pictures that help us to see and to, in some ways, engage with an idea of what forgiveness is. And so let's look at these pictures. I I have 10 written down here that we're going to go kind of look at. Some of them, I'll quote the verses so you don't have to turn to them. Some of them, you're just really familiar with the verses, so we won't turn to them, but we will turn to some of the verses. But there are 10 pictures that are going to help us understand that definition of forgiveness that I just gave. Okay? Here we go. Let's dive into these. The first one, just going to rehearse from last week, debt forgiveness. Okay? Now, this is probably the most common way to use this particular word, is the forgiveness or the release of a debt. Okay, Jesus in Luke chapter 7, with the the notorious sinful woman who comes, and Jesus then tells this parable about the one who owed little and the one who owed much, and both of them have their debts forgiven. In other words, removed, released. Okay? There's no more obligation to pay. Their debts have been forgiven. All right? Um, a lot of us are aware of all of the debt removal programs going on right now and how there's debt forgiveness available for, for different things. It's a very common way of understanding debt. The debt is no longer required or exacted from somebody. This is debt forgiveness. That's one. Two, is this idea of pardon or canceling. So I want you to turn to the book of Jeremiah, if you would. It's in the Old Testament. If you flip back in the Old Testament, you hit Psalms, you need, to keep, you need to turn to the right. If you hit Isaiah, you need to turn to the right just a little bit more, and you'll hit Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 50. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 20. I love this picture of forgiveness. And in particular, it's the word pardon. Okay, pardon. Maybe we've, you've heard of that because you, you've heard about presidential pardons or this idea of, you know, and you wonder, what is that exactly? Okay, well, here's a pardon. I, uh, Jeremiah 50, verse 20, in those days and in that time, declares the Lord, iniquity shall be sought in Israel and there shall be none. In sin, in Judah, and none shall be found. For I will pardon those whom I leave as a remnant. You catch that? This is like, this is like hide and seek, okay? This is, people are searching out for transgression, for sin, for wrong, and and they're searching out for it, and guess what? They won't find it because of what a pardon is. A pardon is like it's never happened. It's off the record. It's a pardon. It's a beautiful picture. Pardon, or another word used in Scripture, is this idea of canceling, okay? So now I'm going to ask you to flip all the way back into the New Testament to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 2. 
Verse 13 and 14, I'll read it to you. I think you're very familiar with this passage, but it says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. There's this canceling action. It says this, this record he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Wow, it's powerful. God takes your record of sin, and and there is a record of your sin. Some of you rehearse it a lot in your mind, and you dwell on it. There is a record of your sin, and Jesus dealt with it. He takes the record against you and he cancels it. It's done. Pardoned and canceled. These are beautiful pictures of forgiveness. Okay, so we have debt forgiveness. We have pardon and canceling. There's another one, covering. Okay, Psalm 32. If you want to turn there, you can. Otherwise, I'll just read it for you. Psalm 32. It says this, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Now we're going to come back to Psalm 32 again a couple more times as we go through this. But did you catch that? Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Interestingly enough, later on in the passage... He says in verse 5, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. So there's a covering that works and a covering that doesn't. (laughs) When you try to cover your sin, it doesn't work. But when God covers it, it's effective. The picture here is most likely an echo from the Exodus. When the Israelites were told that they needed to slaughter a lamb, a spotless male lamb, and take the blood, and they were to wipe it on the doorposts and the mantle of the the house. And that, that would act as a covering to hide them from the angel of death who was going to come and plague Egypt. And so this blood became a covering of sorts for their sin, for our sin. The blood of Jesus becomes a covering for our sin. God passes over those who are covered. So there's another picture for us, covering of our sin. Another picture, blotting out or canceling. If you go to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 44. I hear less and less pages turning. That means there's fatigue already. All right, Isaiah chapter 44, verse 22 says this, I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like a mist. Return to me, says the Lord, or return to me for I have redeemed you. This blurring of the record so that it cannot be read. So I, I have two fountain pens. Um, they were both gifts to me and I enjoy using them. I love using them. One of them in particular if I don't fill it quite correctly or I don't get the pressure right, I guess, in the pen, it drips while I'm writing. And so I'll be writing, you know, this beautiful piece of art, you know, this note. And all of a sudden, the ink will drip out. And it's, it's a big glop of ink bloop, right on the page. Okay? And if it lands on a word, you can't read it. It's been totally blurred out. It's just this big smudge, and it's a big mess, and you can't discern what it says. Do you get the picture there? So you have a record, a record with the details of your sin and your transgressions, and just imagine God taking a big thing of ink and just kind of blotting all over the page and saying there's no longer any clear, discernible marks on here. Your iniquities have been blotted out. Also similar to cancellation. This idea of like a cloud, he says. This idea is that it's, it's so fuzzy you can no longer see anything. 
God blots out your sin. There's another picture in Micah. I want you to turn to this one. Now, Micah might be one of those books that's a little harder to find. It's a, it's a little book. Towards the New Testament, right before Nahum, right after Jonah, okay? There's only seven chapters, so it's easy to pass by, okay? So Micah chapter 7, verse 19. We're being reminded of who is God, and he's a, he, he pardons iniquity. He passes over transgression, verse 18. He does not retain his anger forever, but he delights in steadfast love. Verse 19, he will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Another beautiful picture. So all of your iniquity, all of your guilt. God says, well, first of all, I'm, I'm going to obliterate this. All right? It has substance. I'm going to turn it into a non-substance. I'm going to trample it underfoot. I'm going to overpower it. Some of you are still dominated by guilt of your past. I think we need to remember what God does with our sin. For some of you, it, it, it literally has crippled you in your life. The sin was 50 years ago. 30 years ago, 20 years ago, while you were on assignment. And yet, you have let that sin and the guilt of that sin keep you from stepping up and leading and doing what's right. Could be you've let sin dominate you so much that you don't lead your family. Because I just can't. I'm too bad. You hear that there's need for volunteers within the church and leaders to step up and to place and to serve. And in your heart, you're like, that would be so, I, I would love to do that, but uh, I can't. Because if they only knew my past. And you let sin cripple you from actually engaging in life-giving ministry, whether it's to your family or whether it's to the body of Christ. Listen to this. He tramples your iniquity beneath his feet and then he casts it into the depths of the sea. Now there's two possible pictures here of this casting into the depths of the sea. One could just be the generic idea that if you really want to put something away permanently for a really long time, you go in the ocean, you put some weights around it and you drop it and you say, see you later. I never want to see you again. <laughs> or it could be this is hearkening back to, once again, the Exodus. When Egypt's chariots were all in the river, chasing after, trying to overcome the people of Israel, and God says, Moses, withdraw your stick, or maybe he said put it over, over the river again, and all the water rushes together, and they're drowned in the depths of the sea. There was no Egyptian warrior climbing out of the sea threatening Israel anymore. It was done. They were cast into the depths of the sea. Some of us go fishing, though, <laughs> for our sin. Because we want to feel bad about it. We want to pay for it. We want to do something. We, we feel like we need to. I've got to pay for that somehow. So we go, back, we go back to fishing, trying to hook our sin. So we can remind ourselves of it. We can meditate on it. We can think about it. And we can remind ourselves of why we owe so much and why we can't serve or why we can't minister. There's a beautiful picture of being cast away into the depths of the sea. We don't have to turn there for time's sake, but Isaiah chapter 38 says he casts all my sin behind his back. He takes all of our sin and he throws it behind his back. Isaiah chapter 1 says, Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be whiter than snow. Here's another picture. It's the washing away of sin. What does Jesus do with your sin? He actually washes you. Now, I, I particularly love this picture, and it did, it did heavily influence my definition of forgiveness. Because 
you know, what are suds for? Have you ever wondered why, why, why does soap get bubbly? Okay, is it really just to make us feel like we're doing something clean? You know, like, ooh, it's bubbly, it's foaming, we must be doing something good. Now, I'm sure there's some people who, who could argue this point with me, but I think suds actually help lift and remove, make it easier to wipe away the grime and the grease and the stuff that's within whatever it is we're washing. Those suds, the bubbles, they help lift it up off the thing and then we can wipe it away and we're not just rubbing it right back into the, into the carpet or the clothes or whatever, right? In one sense, you could say God is taking, he takes us, he takes our sin, he takes our guilt, and he's scrubbing and he's washing away our sin. He's actually removing it from us. He's separating the grime and the guilt and the grease stains of our lust, and he's pulling it away from us. He's washing us. Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be white as snow. A beautiful picture of God washing away our sin. We've got four more, okay? Or excuse me, three more. Here we go, number seven, intentional forgetting. (laughs) You say, what? Intentional forgetting. You see, in multiple passages, and even some of the ones we read, it says that God will remember our sins no more. Now, some of you are like, ah, this is weird. I thought God knew everything. Doesn't God know everything? Isn't he omniscient? Yes, he is but he chooses to not remember your sin against you. He chooses to not think of you and immediately think of how bad you are. He chooses not to think of you and immediately, immediately associate you with all the pain you caused him. Instead, he's actually separated those things and he thinks loving Thoughts and lots of them. How many are your thoughts towards me, O Lord? He loves you and he intentionally chooses not to remember your sins against you. And there's a huge implication in that, by the way, when it comes to forgiveness of people. We're going to talk about that more next week. But intentional forgetfulness. God's intentional amnesia, okay? He's choosing not to remember your sins specifically against you. There's another one that's similar, and that is this, bad math, (laughs) okay? Literally, God does not count your sin against you. That same passage, Psalm 32, we could go to, right? Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven. It says, who the Lord does not count their iniquity, right? Paul quotes that in Romans chapter four. The same idea, You're, you are blessed if God does not count your iniquity against you. The idea is that it's, it was there, it's countable, and as he's tallying up the record, as he's, you know, working the equations, he passes over and does not count your transgressions. Wow, it's amazing. Because it sure would be easy to count all my iniquities. Stack them up one on top of the other. Again, again, again. This type, this kind, this time. And he doesn't do that. He doesn't count our sins against us. There's an an intentional release of the account. There's two more the ninth and the tenth picture that I just, I kind of put a whole bunch together because there's so many. There are so many. We're we're actually not going to cover some of them. We're not going to cover the scapegoat, which is a beautiful picture. Okay. So the ninth one I've labeled this, killing it, crucifying it, condemning it. (laughs) Killing it, crucifying it, condemning it. This is what Jesus does with our sin. Romans chapter eight, verse three. Turn there if you would, please. Romans chapter 8, verse 3, it says, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And get this. Romans 8, verse 3, the end of the verse, it says this, And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. 
It's not that sin doesn't matter. Sin really does matter. Sin is a big deal. God isn't up there with a rug and a broom and just kind of, you know, sweeping the sin underneath and pretending it doesn't exist. Something had to be done with it. He condemned it. Other passages talk about how he became sin for us, and that's really the tenth picture. The tenth picture is this, and that is that there's someone else carrying our sin. He's transferred our sin. Isaiah chapter 53, and the Lord has laid on him, that is Jesus, the iniquity of us all. 1 Peter 2, 24, God made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So there's some really beautiful pictures here of forgiveness. But if you observe all those pictures, you'll notice something, that it's actually God taking our sin away from us. I think Psalm 103 talks about this in a beautiful way. It, it basically says this, says this that, that as far as the east is from the west, so far as he what? Removed our sin from himself. So far has he removed our sin from us. He is separating the sin from us. This is forgiveness. It's the act, the merciful act of God, whereby he separates our sin from us and removes the just judgment that we deserve. This is forgiveness. And it's really important for us to understand this. So those were the pictures. Debt forgiveness, pardon and canceling, covering, blotting out, removal, casting away, washing away, intentional forgetting, not counting it, killing it, crucifying it, condemning it, carrying sin, transferring sin. All of these beautiful pictures so that you, in your weak moments, have multiple passages multiple images that you can run to in the Bible and say, but God, who is rich in mercy. So I don't know, once again, where you're at right now with your own sin. But God is rich in mercy and he offers you full pardon, full forgiveness of your sin. He offers to take that sin and to throw it behind his back, to throw it into the depths of the sea. He wants to wash it and remove it, to cancel it, to kill it. He wants to do that if you will receive it. And that's going to actually bring me to the second point. So our first point, what is forgiveness? It's the gracious, merciful work of God in separating our sins from us and removing the just judgment we deserve. Second point, what are the pre-requirements then for forgiveness? Are there pre-requirements or is forgiveness, is this just universalism? God's forgiven all sins of all time, of all people, all in all places, and it's just done? Well, there's actually two parties in forgiveness. There's the one who offers forgiveness, but forgiveness has to be received. And so what are these pre-requirements? First of all, there's pre-requirements of God. There are pre-requirements of God when we talk about forgiveness, and in general, you could say it this way, it's a generous heart of love and mercy, okay? But I have three specific things that are pre-requirements for God. One is a loving determination to restore a relationship. A loving determination to restore a relationship. You could label this God's jealousy. God's jealousy. He wants a relationship with you, and he wants a purified you, a sinless you. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. 
God has demonstrated over and over that actually he passionately wants to have a relationship with you. He wants the relationship restored. So, one of the pre-requirements for forgiveness would be that God actually wants and is determined to restore the relationship. And I'm happy to say, he is. So determined, in fact, that he himself would pay the price, which is the second prerequisite, you might say, for God. And that is this, number two, an ability to cover the expense and absorb the pain. An ability to, to cover the expense and to absorb the pain. I think we could call this God's justice. God does not have a light view of sin. Not at all. In fact, the Bible says this, God is angry with sinners every single day. What? Yes. He is angry with the wicked all day long, the Bible says. And this is why we need so badly to be separated from our sin pulled apart, have it no longer clinging to us. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews. In Hebrews 10, verse 4, we're reminded that the sacrifice of goats The blood of bulls could not take away sin. It was not efficacious is the word. It's not able to, not powerful enough to, not sufficient for. It just can't do it. It's weak. (laughs) Okay? Bull blood and goat blood are weak. They, They can't cover sin. Instead, look at chapter 9, verse 12. He, being Jesus, entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons for the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, how much more will that Purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Jesus was able to cover the expense with his own life. I think that we often read through the Gospels and the passion narrative of the Gospels far too quickly and with too little meditation. Because some of you in here, you, you, you know what it's like to be overwhelmed by your own guilt and your own shame, and you know the pressure and the weight and the, and the, the lowness that you feel when you think on your sin. And yet Jesus bore all of your guilt and the person sitting next to you and the person next to them and the person on death row and the person who's gotten away with abuse. And he's actually taken all of their guilt, all of their shame on himself. Absorbing the guilt, the shame, the embarrassment, the crippling effects of sin. And then on top of this, the wrath of God poured out on Jesus on the cross. Jesus absorbed, he covered the expense, he absorbed the pain. And in fact, I love the final words of Jesus. It is finished. It's done. He did it. He took all of it. He took all the sin, all the guilt, and he paid for it, and it was paid in full, and he said, it's finished, it's final. So prerequisites 
on God, or one, a loving determination to restore a relationship. Two, the inability to cover the expense and to absorb the pain, and that is exactly what Jesus did. And in 1 John, it actually says that God put forth Jesus as a propitiation. That is, the one who could satisfy all of his wrath and remove our sin. That's what that word means, okay? There's a third pre-requirement, though, and that is this, an offer of forgiveness to the sinner. Pre-requirement for God is this, that he would be so kind and benevolent and loving to offer you forgiveness. And he does this. It's called the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the good news. Given to all. Will you hear it? Will you listen to it? And actually, will you receive it? Because forgiveness is available for all who are willing to see or to receive. And that brings me to the prerequisite on man. What is the prerequisite of mankind? Now, I want to be careful on this one because it is not by works that we're saved, okay? So when I say prerequisite, I'm not saying you need to go out and do these works. And if you do these works, you'll get forgiveness. That's not at all what I'm saying. But there is a type of heart attitude, a type of posture that will receive forgiveness and a posture and a heart that won't receive forgiveness. You say, what do you mean? Well, these are not in some sequential order. They're meant to be taken all together, but I'm going to list all three of them. One is recognition, two is repentance, and three is a request for forgiveness or the receiving of forgiveness. You say, recognition. What do you mean recognition? Well, Psalm 32, again, we read the passage earlier. David says, I acknowledge my sin. Psalm 51, David says again, my sin is ever before me. I know it. And I will declare it for what it is. Against you and you only have I sinned. There's a recognition of what sin is. Another great example of this coincides with our second point, and that is repentance. And that is this, Luke 18, excuse me, 15, with the prodigal the prodigal son. He's out there, he's in the middle of wasting his life away, and it says, and he comes to himself. It's like he wakes up, and he realizes and recognizes the condition he's in. Once the recognition has happened, once the realization has happened, now you're actually in the way for forgiveness, because you realize you need it. Luke chapter 18, verse 13, if you want to turn there. Some of you thought I was joking when I said we're going to dance around a lot into different passages. You know the story well, but I want you to see it. You have the Pharisee who's praying in the corner. God, I thank you. I'm not like these bad people. I'm so good. Yeah, look at me. And then, you have the, and then you have the publican, right? What does he say? Verse 13, but the tax collector, the publican standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And what does Jesus say? I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. And then he kind of hits on this attitude and this heart, this posture For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Remember John the Baptist's baptism? They called it a baptism of repentance. And the idea was this, that people would come to John the Baptist and in acknowledgement and a posture of repentance and submission to God, they would be baptized. It was not a, you know, some efficacious work to wash away their sin. It was, it was a baptism of repentance. In other words, they were coming saying, I want to be humbled and I want to have a posture to receive God's forgiveness. It was a baptism of repentance. This is why many times in the New Testament, you hear things like repent and be baptized for the remissions of sin. It's not saying that baptism somehow saves you. It's saying you need to have a repentant, humble heart that recognizes your sin and repents from it or turns from it. Third, 
prerequisite for mankind is a request. Or you could say it this way, receive the forgiveness. Romans chapter 10, I love this passage. Romans chapter 10, verse, I'll I'll just start in verse 9. It says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. But listen to this next verse. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. If you call out and you ask for repentance, you receive it. You receive it. You're not going to be put to shame. Your list of deeds won't be pulled up and read to you. Oh, yeah? This one, this one, this one? This one, this one? It won't be that way. It's actually, you're not put to shame. So, those are the prerequisites. So you've got the definition of forgiveness. We've got the prerequisites for God and the prerequisites for man. So let's talk about a few of these implications. We're not going to get to all of these. We'll get to some of these. The first one I want us to notice, and I've touched on briefly already, and that's this. You can't pay for God's forgiveness. You can't pay for God's forgiveness. You know what's unique? Is as I began to look through the list of all those pictures that God mentions about forgiveness, do you know that's what we all try to do without God? We try to cover our sin. (laughs) We try to cancel our own sin. We try to blot it out. We try to cast it away. We try to wash it away. We try to do all sorts of things to try and hide our sin. Have you ever tried to hide the evidence of your own sin? We kind of chuckle when little kids do it, right? They're like, you know, trying to put things under mattresses or, or you, you ask them if they've cleaned the room and they hear your feet coming up the steps. And so what do they do? They run and throw everything under the bed. Whoosh, whoosh, everything's under the bed. They're hiding the evidence that they've just been playing the whole time, right? They're trying to hide the evidence. They're trying to cover up You know what? You can run around and hide all the evidence you want. You don't have the qualifications to actually deal with your sin. But there's one who does, and it's Jesus. He's the one who can genuinely cover your sin. He's the one who can genuinely wash it. He's the one who can throw it away, blot it out, cancel it. You can't. But some of us like to do that. We like to run around and try to hide our sin. As if God doesn't see, as if God doesn't know. You can't do that. You can't pay for your own sin. And I I do want to, I, I want to stress this one more time in regards to service. And that's because of what Hebrews chapter 9 said about Jesus' blood cleansing us from guilt so that we can actually serve. Because guilt cripples. Guilt will cripple you. And if you allow guilt to remain on your heart, in your mind, you can be crippled from actually serving people. But I want you to know something, that if you retain and desire to retain your guilt, in other words, I'm going to pay for this. I've sinned so deeply that I've got I've to retain a little bit of, I've got to pay for this. I don't want just a handout from God. I, don't, I just want to remind you, the posture that actually receives forgiveness is a broken posture and a humble posture, not a posture that says, I don't want a handout from God. I'll pay for my own sin. You don't have forgiveness. But if you have forgiveness, my chains are gone, I've been set free. Now you're actually free to serve and serve people within this church. Some of you, I mentioned that bird last week that had the ring around its neck. You're you're, you're choked in regards to serving and enjoying Jesus and enjoying the fellowship of the saints because you want to retain some measure of guilt because it puts you in control and it gives you an excuse. And actually that's not an embracing of forgiveness. In some ways, it's a rejection of it. And so I want to challenge you. If you found in your own heart that you have allowed yourself to be crippled by your past, Jesus wants you to know his blood is sufficient, his payment was big enough, his love is strong enough, and he can cover your sin. So let's serve one another. 
with freedom. Okay, on the other end of that though, the other end of the spectrum, and I'm gonna close with this, is that you can't presume on God's forgiveness. In other words, it's not cheap. This did cost a lot. It cost him his life. You can't presume on God's forgiveness. Like, oh, you know what? It's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Okay. Just so you know, if you, so I, I, wanna, I wanna just share a little bit of, of me here. Okay, so I'm, I'm the type of person, I grew up with this, this teaching, and I think it's a good teaching, and that is that um, you keep short sin accounts with God. Okay. In other words, you, you, if you sin, you, just, you confess it right there. You move on, you go, you go, you go. And I think that's a good thing. <laughs> but it's actually interesting. The one who actually keeps the short account is God because <laughs> he's the one who offers the forgiveness. But sometimes in the midst of our everyday life, we kind of run to God for forgiveness just to kind of get it out of the way and we forget about the posture of forgiveness. And, and I'm guilty of this. We want, to, we want to eliminate the tension between the relationship or on our own conscience, but we actually don't want to change. <laughs> we don't want to have that humble, broken spirit of God working me, changing me, purifying me, wash me, to truly separate the sin from me. And so we presume upon God's forgiveness, and we actually just go, go, go. And let me just suggest that if you're the type of person who presumes upon, upon God's forgiveness, that you need to pause and think about what you've done and ask God to help you be broken and humble over your sin. Because it didn't come cheaply. He actually paid for it with his life. There's a lot more we could go into, but we'll stop right here for now. So we'll end this week. Next week, we're going to pick up right along the lines of more implications of this, but specifically then, how God's forgiveness of us enables us, empowers us, and even teaches us how we can forgive those who've wronged us. I hope you've been encouraged this morning that God's forgiveness of you is thorough and it's complete and it's final. You can come and you can receive it in humility. If you've never done that before, I pray you will today. If you find yourself bound by your own guilt and shame, receive forgiveness. Humble yourself and receive forgiveness. Let's pray. Father, Thank you so much for the many pictures of forgiveness that you've given us in your word. Lord, you knew that we would be weak in this area. You knew we'd struggle. You knew we'd wrestle with our own guilt and want to pay for our own sin. And so you remind us over and over and over again with clear pictures, clear commands, clear descriptions of what you have done with our sin. I thank you that with you there is forgiveness that you might be feared. I pray that we would reverence you in awe this morning. Our hearts would be filled with gratitude. We'd find new courage to serve, new courage to lead because of the forgiveness we have in Jesus Christ. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Now to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.